Welcome to Real Chemistry. Today we're going to be talking about heating and cooling curves for water. And what we're thinking about here is looking at the temperature of water as we either add heat to it, if we're going from solid to liquid to gas, or as heat comes off of our system as we go from gas to liquid to solid. The main thing we're going to do in this video is do a calculation where we add up the heat needed to heat up water and take it through phase changes. And that means that we're going to use both heat capacity calculations and phase change calculations. So if you haven't yet watched Introduction to Heat Capacity or Phase Changes and Enthalpy and Heat, go ahead and watch those first. Those are going to help you with these calculations. Now, when we warm water, that's the heat capacity part. When we melt or boil the water, that's the phase change part. And these have different ways of calculating how much heat is needed or how much heat is released when we go through these processes. So let's take a look at a heating curve where we're heating up water. And let's take a careful look at the shape and try to think about what's going on here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take water from 40 degrees Celsius to 120 degrees Celsius. So we're heating it up. We're heating up 1.8 grams of water. What does that look like? Well, we're going to add heat to it. And you'll notice that is, in fact, the x-axis down here, amount of heat added. So as we move in this direction, what we're thinking about is adding more and more heat to that water. So you can basically just imagine that we have water on the stove and it starts off at 40 degrees Celsius and we're applying heat from the stove. And what this axis is keeping track of is how much heat have we poured into that water from the stove. On the other hand, our Y axis is temperature. And so as we go higher and higher on the Y axis, our water is getting warmer. So we start out at 40 degrees Celsius and we just heat the water. And that's just a heat capacity problem, right? We have liquid water and we're heating it. And what happens is, as we apply heat, the temperature of the water increases. So that's what you see here. This brown segment, this first brown segment, is liquid water warming up. And that's it. So all we're looking at is, I'm adding heat and the temperature is getting hotter. I have a thermometer in my, in my boiling water or in my water, and I can see that the temperature is rising as I add more and more heat from my stove. But eventually something interesting happens. What happens is the water starts to boil. And you'll notice that if you look at your thermometer when water's boiling, it will stay at the same temperature. Why is that? Well, all the energy that you're adding to your pot of water is going to boiling the water. So if you turn your stove up, the water doesn't get hotter when it's boiling, it just boils faster, and you've seen that, right? You can have a slowly boiling pot of water, it'll be 100 degrees Celsius. You crank up that heat, all you're gonna do is increase the rate of boiling, but you're not going to change at all the temperature of the water. And that's why, in this segment here, where it says H2O gas and liquid, it's flat. Its temperature is not increasing. You'll notice that its temperature stays at 100 degrees Celsius. So during a phase change, temperature is constant. That's a very important principle. So when we're going ahead and turning that gas into a liquid, all the energy is being poured into those water molecules to pull them apart. None of the energy is going into heating up your water anymore. Eventually, though, all your water boils. And so we have a mixture of gas and liquid while it's boiling. But once your pan's empty and all that gas is now above your stove, you just have gas. And gas, of course, you can continue to heat. So once the phase change is done, when we add more heat, that increases the temperature. So this first stage here, that's brown, is a heat capacity problem. We're increasing the temperature of water. And the second phase, where it's flat, is a phase change. And we're not increasing the temperature. We're just boiling water. And this third part is, once again, a phase change. So if we go over here and we think about what equation should we use for each one of these segments of this heating curve? Well, when we're boiling water, that's stage two, we should use this phase change equation, which tells us that the heat released or absorbed is equal to the moles of water that we're boiling, in this case, times the enthalpy, that's this delta H, of that process. On the other hand, for stages one and two, or one and three, I'm sorry, we use heat capacity because there all we're doing is heating water. So this is what makes these problems a little challenging, is we have to break up the calculation into different parts. So if we want to know how much energy it takes to heat 1.8 grams of water from 40 degrees Celsius to 120 degrees Celsius, we have to use both phase change calculations, that's for the boiling part, and we have to use heat capacity, that's for the heating part. Another little trick here is that the, heat, the, the heat capacity of liquid water and gas is different. So the heat capacity I'm going to use in step one turns out to be about four joules per gram degree Celsius. But the heat capacity I'm going to use in step three is different because 
gaseous water has a different structure than liquid water. And so how much energy it takes to heat it changes, and it turns out to be about two joules per gram degree Celsius. So you have to keep track carefully of what variable you're using at what part in this problem. So now let's go step by step through this calculation where we're gonna calculate the quantity of heat needed to warm the water, 1.8 grams, or I'm sorry, to warm 1.8 grams of water from 40 degrees Celsius to 120 degrees Celsius. All right, so I've broken this down into three steps. And you'll notice also that you have a bunch of information here in the bottom right. What you have there is your equations that you're gonna need, those right here. And one of those, the top one, is for phase changes, and the bottom one is your heat capacity equation. You also have the enthalpies of fusion and vaporization. That's how much energy it takes to melt water or to boil water. Finally, over here, you have the heat capacities for water. The heat capacity for solid water, the heat capacity for liquid water, and the heat capacity for gas. So remember, those are different. And that means when you do your heat capacity problem, you got to split it up by what phase you're in. Okay, let's start taking a look at how this problem works. So first, the first step says break apart into the heating phase, uh, the heating and phase change steps. So break it apart into either heating steps or phase change steps. So how do you do that? Well, what you need to think about, and always remember, right, is that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, that's one phase change, and water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So as long as you keep in mind the temperatures at which these different phase changes occur, breaking it apart can be pretty easy, right? So our very first step is heating, because we start out at 40 degrees Celsius, and we're going until we see a phase change. What temperature do we see a phase change at? 100 degrees Celsius. So the very first step is we're just heating the water from 40 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. So this is a heat capacity problem. We're just heating it here. Now, step two is gonna be boiling that water. So in step one, we took the water from 40 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. Now we gotta put in all the energy needed to boil it. So this time we're going to go from H2O, that's liquid, to H2O that's gas. So this guy is a phase change step. So here we're gonna change the phase in step two. All right, but we're not done because the water's still at 100 degrees Celsius and we wanna get it all the way up to 120. So the last step, is just heating that water from 100 degrees to 120 degrees. That's step three. So step three is 100 degrees Celsius to 120 degrees Celsius. And so once again, that's just a heating step. So it's important that at the very start of the problem, you pause and ask yourself, okay, as I heat it, when am I gonna hit my phase changes? And I need to split this problem up by when I hit phase changes. So I heat from 40 to 100 degrees Celsius, and at 100 degrees Celsius, I see a phase change for water. And then after the phase change, I'm still gonna heat it from 100 degrees Celsius to 120 degrees Celsius. That's just a heat capacity problem. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through part by part, and we're gonna calculate the heat associated with each step. So first step one. What I'm gonna go ahead and write down is what the change in temperature is here. So we're going from 40 to 100 degrees Celsius. So that means the temperature change is 60 degrees Celsius. You also have to keep in mind that what we're dealing with here is liquid water. So what heat capacity should we use here? The liquid. And if we go and we'll see that our heat capacity for our liquid water is 4.2 joules per grams degree Celsius. So that's 4.2. And the units there are joules per gram degree Celsius. Now, our heat capacity equation says Q equals CS times mass times delta T. And I'm going to call this Q1 because it's the Q associated with our very first step. And if we plug those numbers in, what we're going to get, first our heat capacity is 4.2. And then we got to plug in our mass. And our mass, it tells us we're heating 1.8 grams of water. So that's what we're plugging in for our mass. And our change in temperature is going to be that 60 degrees Celsius. So what we get out here for Q1, 4.2 times 1.8 times 60 is going to be 453.6 joules. 
Now, this is an important uh, part here where you write down that joules. Why is that joules? Well, it's joules because our heat capacity is in terms of joules. So since our heat capacity is in joules, we get out joules from that calculation. We don't always get out joules in this process. In our phase change step, you'll see that we'll get out kilojoules. All right, so we're done with step one. And now what I'm going to do is the phase change. And phase change, remember, we need moles times the enthalpy to get out the heat. So first of all, what enthalpy should I use? Well, we're going here between liquid and gas. And that means what we're doing is we're vaporizing that water. And so the value we're going to use is 40.7 kilojoules. So we get 40.7. And the units there are kilojoules per mole. All right, now we need the moles of water. And notice that we've been given the grams. So we're going to have to go from grams to moles, and that's a common step. In heat capacity steps, you're going to use grams for your calculation. In phase change steps, you're going to use moles. So you always have to do a moles to grams conversion during this step. All right, so we have 1.8 grams. And we're going to multiply that by 1 mole over 18.02 grams. And when we do that, we'll get out the moles of water we have, which is 0 0.10 moles. So that's our moles. And then what we're going to do is we're going to plug that in to our equation, which tells us that Q, and I'm going to call it Q2 because it's the heat for our second step, is equal to moles times our delta H. And so when we do moles times delta H, we do 0 0.10 times our enthalpy of vaporization, which is 40.7. And when we do that, we're going to get out 4.07 kilojoules. Again, notice these guys are in kilojoules, whereas our top heat for step one is in joules. Both of these are positive because this is heat that we're adding. So the last step is once again a heat capacity step. And our delta T is going from 100 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius. So that means that's 20 degrees Celsius. We also want to think about the heat capacity we're going to be using. And this time, we're going to be using the heat capacity for gas because we've boiled the water. So now the water is gas. It's very important that you think through what's going on in this problem in terms of the phase of water. So remember that between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, we have liquid water. As soon as we boil it at 100 degrees Celsius, we have gaseous water. If you start out below 0 degrees Celsius, you have ice. So make sure you're thinking carefully about what phase you're in in each step of these calculations. So the heat capacity for our gaseous water is 2.0 joules per gram degree Celsius. All right. And now we can just go ahead and calculate our heat by doing the heat capacity times the mass times the change in temperature. And when we do that, our heat capacity we're going to use is 2.0 times the mass, which is 1.8, times the change in temperature, which in this step is 20 degrees Celsius. So we have 2 for our heat capacity times the mass in grams, 1.8, times our change in temperature, 20. And what we'll get out for that when we multiply that together is 72 joules. So now, notice that we have the heat for steps 1, 2, and 3. And our goal here is to get the total heat. How do we calculate total heat? Well, our total heat, QT, is equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. But remember, before we can add them together we actually have to have them all in terms of the same unit, right? So we did step two. That's where we calculated the heat uh, that was needed for each step. And now we're at the last step where we're going to add those heats together. And we have to convert to kilojoules before we can do that so we can add them up. I can't add together joules and kilojoules. And so what I'm going to go ahead and do is go back up to step one where I currently have joules and convert that to kilojoules. There's 1,000 joules in a kilojoule. So you can move the decimal three times and you'll get joules. So this is 0 0.4536 kilojoules. So all I've done is move the decimal three times, or you can think about it as dividing by 1,000. One, two, three. And either one of those is fine. 
Down here, I already have kill joules. In step two, I already have kill joules. So I'm good there. And I can do the same thing with this guy where I move the decimal three times. And that's going to give me 0 0.072 kilojoules. So now what I got to do is add up the heats from each step. So I've calculated the heats from each step. This is Q1. This is Q2. And this right here is Q3. So if I know how much heat it takes to go through each step, then when I add them up, I'll get the total heat. And so the total heat here is going to be my 0 0.0, or I'm sorry, my 0 0.4536. That's for step one. Plus my enthalpy for step two, or I'm sorry, my heat for step two, which is 4.07 kilojoules. Plus my heat for step three, which is 0 0.072 kilojoules. And what I've done is I've just kept all the decimals so far, and you should keep all those decimals in your calculator. And we don't want to worry about sig figs till the very end. And what has the fewest sig figs in our problems is our temperature changes. They only have one sig fig. So when I add all of these together, I'm going to get one sig fig out, and I'm going to get five kilojoules. So these problems are relatively lengthy, as you can see. It takes a while to go through each step of the calculation. And what you're doing is combining heat capacity calculations with phase changes calculations. So if you had problems following any of those calculations, go check out those videos on phase change and enthalpy and on heat capacity. And that'll help you understand how to do these calculations. So what we've found is that if I take 1.8 grams of water and I heat it from 40 degrees Celsius to 120 degrees Celsius, that that's gonna take me five kilojoules of energy. And most of the energy goes into that phase change step. So for a while we heat the water and then once it gets to 100 degrees Celsius, we have to boil it. And that takes four kilojoules as we saw in step two. The last step is heating that water that last 20 degrees Celsius. So we've heated the water all the way from 40 degrees Celsius to 120 degrees Celsius. And that took five kilojoules. If you have any questions about this episode of Real Chemistry, please ask them below. You can also subscribe to receive updates about future videos. Thanks for watching.